Hello everyone, this is your host Arzu and welcome back to another episode of Arzu Art Podcast. Just a friendly reminder that take care of your mental health because we're living in such a crazy time. So instead of just watching news all the time, you can tune in to the podcast you love. So if you love this podcast, just make sure to like, comment and share this podcast with your friends. Here I am with another interview. My today's guest is the loveliest Chris Pern. Chris has worked across the entertainment industry from television to feature film as an animator designer most specifically he's a great storyboard artist and writer and director he has worked in animations such as art of christmas open season and he's the director of my favorite movie cloudy with a chance of meatballs his recent animated feature for netflix is available right now called the willibees it's such an amazing movie if you haven't seen the willibees yet please do yourself a favor and go and watch it in this episode, Chris Pern talks about all his journey of becoming a director from the time that he was working with the legendary Don Bluth. He was also once a student at Sheridan, but it happens that he was also a teacher to my previous guest, Diana Marcielas, which was really interesting for me. And you can go and check out my previous interview if you haven't yet. He also talks about all his experiences that he gained during the time he was working in TV animation. The differences between TV and feature film and the valuable lessons he learned from it. Great tips about storyboard and pitching your ideas about how to layering jokes and adding humor to his work, which is really important in this industry. I'm super excited to introduce Chris Byrne to you. So here we go, everyone. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Chris. So good to have you today with me. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's great to yeah, be here. Wonderful. How are you doing these days? Doing good. Doing good. Fantastic. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody says during a pandemic. How you doing? Doing, doing good. I don't, think, I don't yeah. think any of us really want to be honest, but our voices go up. Like I, You can always tell I'm lying when my voice goes up. Doing okay. That, that, I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah. That, that long pause actually says too much. I mean, it relieves everything about your life. <laughs> I want yeah. to be witty. I want to be witty, but then I'm just worried that honesty is going to come out, and that's a, that's a drag this early in in the podcast. So we, I mean, say we're we're doing good. We're doing good. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we almost all of us uh, feel the same way. So that's all right. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think everyone find a way or another to kind of find a new routine for themselves and uh, get things to a new normal. So that's a good new, thing, though. There's always a new normal showing up, isn't there? You know? Yeah, so new that's, normal. That's life. <laughs> yeah, that's even weird saying that, like new normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So for um, the people who might not know you, unfortunately, <laughs> we need to actually do a little bit of like introduction. I usually um, talk about your past and your childhood and everything. So you were born and raised in Canada and you were living in a farm as far as I know. And I assume that you were a kind of kid that you always loved to draw and you were into like comic and stuff. So is there any specific like characteristic from your childhood that leads you to where you are today that it's a like I don't know it's a thing that you remember that it was really bold in your childhood that you want to talk about it yeah I mean I think um it's funny like hindsight you look back on on sort of where you come from um the isolation like it's funny we're talking about like the new normal <laughs> Uh, being socially isolated was kind of how I was raised. I grew up on, you know, about 200 acres. And, you know, the, the next farm over was another 200 acres. So it was a long walk to get to companionship of any kind. Uh, so I spent a lot of time alone. And uh, I think, you know, just being, you know, in a, in a place where you can be quiet and sort mm -hmm. of just think and uh like as a 45 year old man i barely have time to read or you know kind of reflect on things because just life goes 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 and we're all connected but yeah. you know way back in the ancient times of the uh of the mid 80s like there was nothing like that and uh you know i remember being a kid and like the highlight of the day was when the newspaper would show up in the mailbox and i would run and grab it so i could read the comics and i used to yeah. cut out 
like the 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 you know like the, the four panel setup punchline you know delivery all that stuff uh calvin hobbs far side for better or worse was a big one for me and mm-hmm. I'd, I'd cut them out and make scrapbooks and just spend hours like just reading and rereading and rereading and rereading them and and trying to learn how to draw and um i think just that that desire to you know i think tell a joke um was really just from that space and from that ability to have that room to think i also like it's funny because like we only had like three channels which sounds like a hardship but i think a lot of the oh world kind of went, went, went through that but one yeah. of the channels was uh was always playing this sketch comedy show called sctv have you ever heard of that no no it, I, so, actually but but what is funny even me as a uh, 90 kids i remember that we only have like five uh, national channels back in that time and then later the satellite came and we had like more channels and we were like we're like woo that's a new world yeah. <laughs> kind of had the same thing like when i was a kid we got yeah. one of those gi- you know those giant satellite dishes in the backyard but this show uh, second city tv it, it was where john candy and martin short and Catherine o'hara and uh, dave thomas and rick moranis and like all of these uh like dan Aykroyd sort of came out of the live side of that and then ended up in saturday night live like mm-hmm. all of those great comedians were uh, part of this incubation on this weird show that came out of Hamilton, Ontario, which wasn't far from where I was living. And so like this idea of like comedy was weirdly enough, even though it was in the middle of nowhere, like there was sort of comedy everywhere. And I think when you when you live in a quiet place and you have a lot of influence of people telling jokes, it's it's sort of how you end up becoming a cartoonist for a living. <laughs> so that's uh, that was my pathway, yeah. But yeah, I I actually think you had actually a talent for being a comedian because as far as I know, you you're a really funny guy. So uh, probably those TV shows could have an influence on you as well. So who knows? A lot, a lot of a lot of cow shit. Can I say the word shit? I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yes. I guess yeah. you're free. <laughs> no worries. I think growing up around animals was good too, just because it's like you know you have to have a sense of humor because they don't. So, <laughs> <laughs> were, were you were you doing like stand up comments in front of your um, the animals or something like that? No, honestly, no? like I think if I if I couldn't do what I'm doing now, I I would love to try stand up, but I've never had the courage to do it. When, when I when I was when I was in my 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 teenage years, when we when we finally got that giant side satellite dish i remember watching stand-up for the first time on comedy central and it just blew my mind because i'd never seen anything like it before um yeah it's actually funny because my, my my parents who were you know they're kind of just blue collar rural rural mm-hmm. type people and uh the two things that they always made us do me and my brother is one was public speaking so i used to have to do like this thing called toastmasters where you had uh-huh. to write speeches and go around and different like Shriners clubs or whatever and and do these speeches. And uh-huh. I kind of hated it when I was a kid, but it's one of those skills that just serves me to this day. And I think if I had a, you know, if I hadn't done that, I probably would have been a complete introvert. So that was good. The other thing was typing, like like learning how to type. We had to learn how to type. And that was, uh, my dad was weirdly enough kind of a, a tech guy. So we always had like the latest computer, even if it was in the 80s. And all it did was move little bars of color. But he was kind of, he was never, uh, he was never shy of that stuff. So I think, you know, that served me well in this industry because yeah, you never know what, what kind of tools you're going to have to use, you know? Yeah, that's that's interesting actually it's only like i think 30 or 40 years ago but it sounds like like hundreds of years ago when you look back you know the technology just i mean yeah. improved so fast now yeah. when you look back at, at all those big satellite dishes and you know it's, it's weird i don't know uh, because even i i feel like i can relate so yeah <laughs> we used to have a phone that was stuck on a wall and I had a cord <laughs> and they oh. had antennas you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and they were huge they were like a big block I don't know if, uh, I don't know if life is actually any better <laughs> with all the things that we have I mean I think I think Spotify might be the one thing I would be sad to lose but everything else I could probably live with it I like having all the songs I want in my pocket other than that I'm, yeah. I'm, I miss I miss uh yeah I miss the excitement of going to the video store and renting a movie or like going yeah. to the theater because you couldn't see et anywhere else you had to go to the theater i, I kind of miss yeah i mean yeah. i know we're probably all missing the theater right now because you know covid but i think uh even before covid i just kind of stopped go- 
going to movies because it was such a hassle and it was just easier to you know download it on apple or whatever so yeah, yeah. Uh, i kind of miss i kind of miss a bit of the event you know yeah i know it's actually funny because uh we we that's why i think these days the meditation and everything becomes so fashionable because everything is going just towards one point so fast and you kind of need to slow down sometimes just at yeah. least for 10 minutes for yourself so you know yeah it's it's I, i guess like yeah when i was a kid again way back in the old days i don't remember anybody meditating and now it seems no. like everybody meditates because they have to right because they gotta find yeah, that exactly like if, even with the, the thing that you mentioned about um waiting for newspapers i remember we also had like subscription to this there was this magazine for childs back in that time um so we had this subscription and every month when it came we were like with my friends we were going through all the pages reading it and even we want to like write for them so our name we will be included in the magazine so it was like the best day ever for us if we end up in the magazine you know <laughs> get your picture in the paper that was all yeah get the, your name in print you've made it you've made it exactly yeah. now now does everyone just do the sh hashtag shout out and everything you're like all right cool <laughs> i feel i feel yeah i feel like everybody judges you by how many followers you have i don't yeah. i don't yeah i don't know yeah anyway never mind so um <laughs> yeah and and then later you definitely grew up and got to the university agent uh how did you end up in sheridan yeah actually uh my previous guest was uh diana marcellis i don't know if you know her oh, she's a uh, yeah. diana was one of my weirdly enough one of my students uh no way. That's yeah so yeah oh my god so so yeah, she how, was my how, her previous how do you know Diana? Um, actually from her work from uh, Pixar, obviously. Yeah, she's oh, amazing. Yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she's yeah. So but re recently she's working in um, this new Pixar upcoming and all that. So yeah, yeah. She was also went to Sheridan. So you were the professor. Oh my God, Lord, this industry is small. And the word is well, so small. Well, I got really lucky in that I was the art kid all the way through elementary school and high school. And, um, you know, I was getting towards the end of, of high school uh -huh. and I, I was was coming to that crossroads that I think a lot of artists come to where it's like okay now I gotta figure out what I want to do with my life and mm -hmm. all I wanted to do was draw comics like that was like and not not like superhero comics I mean like Calvin Hobbes I just I, I just wanted to tell jokes with four mm -hmm. panels and um you know I was convinced I couldn't do that I had pretty good grades I was gonna head towards like University of Toronto to go to architecture school or engineering or something like that and I had a guidance counselor who uh said to me is like have you ever considered this you know college in Oakville which is an hour and a half away from where I was going to high school uh, they teach this course in animation now you got to keep in mind this is before like there's no internet there was like art of books were around but they were very niche I never heard of them I didn't mm -hmm. I think anybody actually did that for a living and I didn't know that there was even an industry in uh. Canada so um, yeah I got I had a, an old Jeep pickup truck and I hopped into that with my buddy who was looking to go to school in Toronto and we did a road trip drove up to uh to the city and then um you know got to Sheridan and, and walked in and I I blew my mind that there was this yeah. place where people were drawing for a living and um, more people like you your tribe right and and uh yeah. I I don't think I would have gotten in if I had have applied three or four years later because The Lion King came out when I was in my first year of college and suddenly all of this attention started showing up because there was a handful of Canadians that worked on The Lion King and um, mm -hmm. they all came out of uh, you know Sheridan College and so this little school that like when I went to, to Sheridan we started with 120 students and they graduated about 30 of us and and the reason the attrition rate was so high was you know a handful of us would get jobs and then you'd just, just go out into the industry and make a living and then they would also like just weed us out because it, it was i remember like mark simon who was one of our teachers was like mm -hmm. like in the in the first year he was like you know doing that thing you know look to the right look to the left chances are you know one, two of the three of you won't be here by the end and back in that day like it was catch as catch can so like in the canadian tv industry some people would work six months a year and then have to find something else for six months because it was all uh, based on on the cable cycle 
are on the TV broadcast cycle. So the year I went in, Lion King burst open, and then suddenly all the other studios were trying to to do animation. So, you know, Fox mm-hmm. and DreamWorks and, you know, Universal. And you couldn't find 20 people to, you know, rotate a character, let alone act with them at the time with a pencil. Because, you know, drawing was such a huge skill. So by the time I graduated yeah, yeah. from Syracuse, you could draw. If you had that craft, you could get a job in the States. And so it was a really, really amazing time to sort of come out into an industry that had a fantastic, you know, mentorship culture. So when mm-hmm. I started industry, I was drawing on paper and I was learning from these incredible artists. And yeah. like I spent three years after college relearning how to draw for the industry, um, which was such an amazing opportunity. And I don't know if it exists anymore. And then weirdly enough, like when I was, you know, my third year of being a professional, that's when Toy Story came out and the writing was um, on the wall. We were all kind of murdered by computers and I got kicked I out of the state for the first time, ended up back in Canada. That's where I met Deanna actually, because I was hustling, doing everything to survive. And I I was teaching part time at Sheridan, and you know that's. Uh, I think th- that was the first lesson that this industry is never. You're never safe in it, but it's also like there's always something happening, and so like mm-hmm. the, the the 2D industry collapsed, and then the, the the you know it took about five to ten years, and then suddenly all the CG studios were were, were there. But exactly. between that, the cable cycle had burst open, so there was so much work in TV. So mm-hmm. you know if you're willing to hustle, you can find. I still think you know there's probably way more opportunity now than there ever has been. Because of video games and you know uh, the bite-sized content that you can just sort of find you know opportunities to distribute your work it's amazing but it's always changing yeah always yeah changing. exactly exactly like uh, what, what you mentioned is actually back in your time uh, because the industry was wasn't that big uh, so it was hard to kind of find a job and all that but these days I think it's so vast and there are so many like variations and everything and sometimes it's really hard to even um, get to know what you're going to do or find your path and way you know so and the and the competition is also so high these days but yeah. I, I, I actually what I think uh, eventually everyone can find their own way kind of so if you're just focused and you just keep going so in a way as as you as you mentioned you kind of can survive yeah but but actually um I didn't knew so from what I know that your first break into the industry was in, in Don Bluth Secret of the Meme I didn't know that you work on it and no, no, that that wasn't was Secret it? of the Meme. I, no, I, I came in at the tail end of Anastasia. So uh, it's Anastasia. Anyway, it was in Do- Don Bluth in a way, right? Yeah, no, Don was like my first, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, director I worked for. And um, I, Secret of the Meme was the movie that made me want to be an animator even before I knew animation was a thing. Uh, uh, like talk, remember we were talking about like like going to the movie theater. I remember going to the movie theater to watch Secret of Nim, and I had never seen anything like it before. And you got to remember back in the eighties, like the Disney movies were kind of getting they were few and far between. And uh, you know, Secret of Nim kind of started a new revolution. And it, and after that was American Tale, where you know they put a mm-hmm. music video with the movie. And like being a kid with three channels, I could watch the video hits, you know, TV show yeah. and, and and catch little you know bits. Of the movie and like like so it was it was dawn that kind of created the subversive you know kind of rebellion against what disney had become in the 80s yeah so yeah. working for him kind of set a course in my life like i i always like i i really appreciate and love mainstream any like part of the animation industry but i've always been working in the weird sort of off studios and i think uh it started right from the gate with Don. I remember being like 20 years old and um, I'd been at Fox for a couple of years and mm-hmm. I'd moved I'd moved up the ladder a little bit and I was doing this um, this sort of like character layout job. And uh, I'd come into work every day at like 6 a.m. I was always up early um, and a uh, farmer, you know, and uh, Don, Don, Don would be in early too. And like, I just remember like those quiet mornings, like he would, sh- he would, he would talk to me and come over and he would, uh, he would draw over my drawings and just watching a guy like, that draw what yeah. so and i don't know how many opportunities there are for that in the industry now because everything's kind of digital and we've we've leveled out some of those base skills but like this guy could draw like a fish in water and and yeah it's just down down bluth is absolutely legend i mean i actually watched uh Sin- secret of nymph some time ago and again i mean and i was really impressive to these days the story and the animation and everything is so fresh i mean you never get tired of that movie so 
Uh, but finger, like Nicodemus's fingers, they were they like they were always like moving around, and they had all these lines. Exactly. But 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 did you mention that you were doing like layouts and that, or anim you were two D animator, or you were doing layouts? Started off as as a rough in betweener, so the job was uh. literally. I remember the first thing I got there was like a character in the foreground doing a weight shift. So it was like drawing number one, and then drawing number you know two hundred and eleven, and then it was just like a timing chart that I had to just break it down on ones. So the entire like like whatever long the, the shot was, this guy in the foreground was just moving from one leg to the next, and that was my entry into like two D animation. But yeah, so I was a I was a rough in betweener, and then I was doing um, I moved up into assistant work, and assistant work you're kind of doing what was called overlapping action, so like mm -hmm. hair and clothing, and I uh, was doing was learning lip sync, and mm -hmm. then uh, and then there was an opportunity to go into uh, uh, design and, and and character layout, and and at the time I had an inkling to be a story artist and so there was a Canadian working in that department named Chris Shouten and he mm -hmm. took me on wing uh, Chris is currently living up in Ottawa he's an amazing artist one of the one of the best in the industry and, yeah. uh, and so uh, yeah so I went over to that that side of the world pretty early in my career and and what was weird at Fox was um, you know it was a pretty large studio at the beginning but then as the industry began to change it, it reduced mm -hmm. and reduced and so by the end I was doing I was painting I was learning how to paint from you know Ken Slevin and 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 some of the amazing artists there and I was doing mm -hmm. effects work I was animating by the end and it was kind of cool and and it really trained me for the changing industry because at the end of the day the paper was going away but those skills weren't so when I went back to Canada to the TV industry you mm -hmm. just had to survive so I was doing everything I was doing you know I was animating when I could find animation work and then I was doing layout and I was doing backgrounds and I was doing you know character design and whatever I could do to to survive until I got into doing story mm -hmm. um, and then once yeah. I got into doing story that's where I stayed so I've been doing that pretty much for 20 years you just mentioned that you also uh, worked on so many like TV TV programs and stuff so but um, since then you've um, had this transition to becoming a storyboard artist so definitely the pipeline of um, TV animation is so different from feature right so yeah. I mean you but um, I would like to know like what was some of the most valuable valuable experiences that you gain from TV because obviously it's more uh, fast paced and you have to really keep up with the, the, the pipeline and everything and also I, I believe that um, usually like TV programs are well I mean definitely lower have lower budget than a feature film so um, what was the most valuable thing that you learned from uh, being in TV industry I think you know uh... As cheesy as it sounds, I think it's 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 the it's the craft, it's the work. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, nobody was really holding your hand because you did have to move so fast, right? So mm -hmm. um, if you screw up something, you just you bang up the production, and the supervisors have to jump in and, and bail it out. So if you Ouch. wanted to keep working, you had to stay you had to stay on that treadmill. So for for me, like like you know, um, it was it was a good lesson. Um, I don't know how to say this without without swearing, but there's this notion of like kind of f you give me my movie, is mm -hmm. is 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 the the one truth in the industry. And like there's that old saying, it's like you know artists sit around and wait for inspiration. Yeah, artists sit around and wait for inspiration, <laughs> but professionals you know shut the f up and get the work done. And I think I think the 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 TV industry it. it it makes you hard in that way. And I think mm -hmm. where where it's tough is sometimes it's it's like when you get better at your craft, you know, we all have the desire to, you know, A, communicate to as big an audience as possible, but also like challenge ourselves. So mm -hmm. I think early days in, in TV, what I loved about it was like, I didn't know what I didn't know. So every day I was still like, I was learning and I was I was figuring out how to cut with 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 like my compositions. I was I was getting better as a as a quick draw artist because I had to draw fast. And so I was still using all my animation skills. And you know, I was thinking about, you know, interpreting a script going back to where I first started as an artist, which was, mm -hmm. you know, what is the joke? So like if I'm if I'm reading a TV script and it's you know a show about fuzzy bunnies that don't crown for preschoolers, mm -hmm. I, I had to think like, well, what would a kid find funny here or what what is where is the moment of entertainment in all of this dialogue and you know mm -hmm. that ability to sort of 
I think, interpret a script and make choices. Like you, you're wiggling around in the box that you're given. And, I, and there's a lot of creative opportunity. And I really think for myself, like as an artist, like I love reacting to material. So I think it sort of started that, that love of almost animation improv, like saying yes and. So instead of getting angry or frustrated or annoyed by scripts that weren't always great, mm -hmm. um, I just tried to make best, like, uh, best choices I could. And I love the math of that. And I love the experimenting in that. And I think that that sort of, um, you know, muscle really served me well when I transitioned out of TV and features where mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's really the same job. I mean, you're, 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 you're creating, you know, character moments and you're moving a camera around and you're setting up, you know, a shot sequence, mm -hmm. but you're also like, what ifing? And because, you know, in a TV show, if you're doing 15, you know, 20 minutes of, of content, well, those, you know, minutes, they just go by. And if it's good, it's good. If it's not, who cares, you know, we'll catch the next one and you all, everybody's mm -hmm. trying to do the best work they can but when you're doing a feature you're you're auditioning for 85 minutes of material and you're mm -hmm. asking an audience to sit there and watch it so so much of what is different between tv and feature is just the fact that you throw 90 percent of the work out in feature as, as a story mm -hmm. artist and yeah. so being being flexible and not thinking of a script as being a, a blueprint but the the suggestion of a blueprint you know what i mean like it, it's yeah. it's it's all it's all context specific and it's about you know trying stuff and seeing what's funny or seeing what's dramatic or seeing what's you know entertaining mm -hmm. and being honest about that which is the hardest thing in the world and I, I remember working i when it was when i was down working in features i was working for chris and phil uh miller mm -hmm. and lord there on cloudy one and mm -hmm. i was still that person who cared about drawing and i would like be really like finicky and picky with my drawings and they would mm -hmm. find the prettiest drawings in my sequences and cut them <laughs> and I don't think they did, did it on purpose but once the once the drawing gets overthought the moment stops being fresh and I think yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that that was a big lesson that started in TV because we were moving so fast so I think the two the two worlds kind of um like complement each other even to this day like I love doing yeah, TV and, yeah, and uh, yeah. I don't I don't do as much of it as I used to but like it's it's such a, a refreshing treadmill sometimes when you're just wanting to get something done like it's 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 great mm -hmm. so yeah do, do you have yeah. like any particular tv animated tv shows recently that you've watched or like or i mean i love big mouth like i i, I love it's uh, hilarious oh my god yeah. yes it's funny because we were working with um i was working with my Maya, Maya rudolph for the willoughby's and, and yeah, she, yeah, yeah she's my favorite like connie the uh the the, the female hormone monster is like my favorite on that show it's our, hilarious. Our, our, our yes. both poles. she's so funny and i would like i just sort of pepper her with you know how did how did you come up with that <laughs> like how much of that was written how much of that was improv and i, I just find i find comedians fascinating just sort of yeah. how they're Sure. Yeah. I, I always think like comedians are smart people because they, they observe like every single details that you might not even think about and then they exaggerate them in a way that it's just hilarious and I love Maya as well like in SNL uh, her characters I mean every every role she plays is just so funny anyway back back to what you just say um, I actually really think as well that sometimes um, when, you, when you watch the reels of the um, animated movies or even uh, like TV shows sometimes they feel more as you mentioned when you overthink a drawing uh, they might lose that sense of being funny or um, the expressions and everything so sometimes I find reels more interesting than the final product to be honest so yeah, um, yeah but I, I actually wanted to mention as well that um, everyone Chris also has a storyboard uh, course in schoolism which you can go and check it out and um, I bet it's awesome I wanted to actually talk talk about um now that you talk about all these uh, things um a lot of people that who wants to uh, become a storyboard artist so they usually i don't know obviously you had a lot of experience on doing so many roles uh, in the animation but they usually for example ask where should we start and all that but obviously i think as a storyboard artist you need to have a lot of knowledge about different genres of um movies and um, about cinema and knowledge of how the shots work, how the camera works. Um, uh, what I think uh, is that like in TV, as you 
mentioned like in TV shows, um, because um, each episode just going quickly. Um, you you might love one episode more than the other one. Might one might be funnier than the other one. But actually, in a full length movie, you have to um, keep audience attention alive and um, so they can stick around to the end of the movie so uh, my question is how can like people get this uh, skills like if they want to become a storyboard artist because a lot of people sometimes don't really know I mean they think that they should only work in one genre they, they just want to do comedy scenes you know but I don't th really think it's how it works so it's kind of like you have to have a vast knowledge and general knowledge of everything all in one so do you have have any yeah. like tips or I don't know well I mean it, 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 there's kind of there's two sides of the brain I think when you you know kind of you know try to figure out how to get into the line of work that is story I think you mm -hmm. know there's the crap there's the craft side so mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 stronger you are as a drafts person you know the ability to you know get the idea out of your head on the paper with as few lines as possible mm -hmm. is is valuable so like you know drawing skills are important and it's not just the a matter of like understanding anatomy or understanding the mechanics of how uh, you know things move but also spatial relationships and um, I always encourage young story artists to you know invest in I mean if nowadays everyone's got an iPhone with a really good camera on it but like back in the day I mean like get a camera and mm -hmm. I, I think I think even with an iPhone, it's important. I, I still think if you have the resources, you know, get a camera with multiple lenses so mm -hmm. that you you actually like when you when I take my SLR out and I'm, I, I have my big camera, like I'm out to take photos. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm I'm you know just somewhere with my phone in my pocket and I pull it up, take a, a quick cheap picture. Like when you get your head into the mindset of being somebody with a camera you start looking for compositions and you start looking for you know things to capture and I think even getting a film camera is a good exercise because it forces mm -hmm. you to, to make choices mm -hmm. and you get to learn from mistakes I think everything is so disposable now that sometimes we don't think so um, I think the ability to sort of look at storytelling from the point of view of a camera is very important so there's the drawing there's the there's the idea of like framing things and then the other side of that is 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 the entertainment value i mean we are actors and we're we're storytellers and essentially mm -hmm. a storyboard artist is telling is making a movie before a movie gets made and and you're auditioning material and so to give that material a chance and to actually be effective you have to understand what the material is and so if you're doing a dramatic moment i mean there's a lot of film history that is is you know out there that we are standing on the back of like that we we've, we've learned from i mean where you put a camera matters and how you how you cut matters like how you how you progress in on a character's emotions matter mm -hmm. if you're if you're telling a joke i mean it's like do you do you let the audience know that the joke is coming so they're ahead of it or do you hide it from them and the camera is the thing that gives you those options and mm -hmm. so like there's a real mechanical vaudeville nature to what we do which is which is trained and observed and it and i like i always just you know i say if you don't love movies you shouldn't be doing this you know mm -hmm. there's no reason to be um to be exactly. in the entertainment business if you're not into being entertained and so it's like the way stephen king talks about you know if you want to be a writer you got to read i think mm -hmm. it's the same it's the same notion like that you we have to we have to learn from just what's out there and so and then and then the more you know the more you can innovate and be subversive and break rules and stuff like that but like it, it's that um it's that thing about like being you know self-aware enough to be a craftsman so or craftsperson so but like mm -hmm. uh yeah. yeah does that make sense yeah i mean you just put up everything so well i, I have nothing else to add fantastic so yeah but i have one question because your movies are all of them are so hilarious but i would like to know like how because obviously you you just mentioned that you love sitcoms you well, love comedy and everything but i would like to know like a lot of part of comedy is cultural so for example if you if you like put a canadian joke obviously probably i wouldn't understand in the movie but anyway i would laugh at 
some other parts of it. I want to know, like, how do you do that and know that um, your jokes can be like worldwide so it can make sense to um, most of the audience around the world? Yeah. So to be honest with you, there, there's a point in creation where you just have to be a little narcissistic and you just, you know, I, I don't think about how far these things travel. And, you know, usually like in the first few passes, we're, we're trying to make ourselves laugh. And so like in the story, <laughs> the story department, like it's generally, you know, six to 12 people and, you know, you're working with editors and you're working with the directors or if when I am directing, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time sitting in, mm -hmm. in editorial watching the animatic trying to really entertain myself and I think you know what I love about making films is like there's the puzzle which is a bit like a game of you know um, chess or, or like Jenga where you're trying to figure out mm -hmm. which tile to pull out of the stack you know without knocking the whole thing over and I love the math of that but then you know at a certain point once you get enough of the blank page gone mm -hmm. then the process is really about trying to connect with an audience and it takes us a long time to find that audience but I'm always screening and so the more I screen, which is sometimes painful because you're you're showing material that's not finished. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, giving yourself the opportunity to have time to adjust, to get cold to the material, to become objective. We we have to use the audience to, to audition the material because I don't have the time to get you know, six months away from the, from the things that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a bit like, this goes back to stand up actually. And, you know, the mm -hmm. notion that it takes 10 years to be a good stand up comedian and, and it takes a year to get an hour of material because you have to go, you know, from one club to the next and just try stuff out and see what lands. And so I think getting that mm -hmm. universality of like, yeah, there's going to be like, for example, in the Willoughby's, I mean, we had, you know, uh, innuendo with the parents and there was mm -hmm. like all of these, I think like the cheeky kind of, you know, awkward sexual jokes, that's very uh -huh. Canadian because we're uh -huh. very repressed, you know, Protestant culture. And so making fun of sexuality is is a, is something that goes back to like I think the British like Benny Hill and Monty Python you know so like those kinds of jokes are are, are 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 layered in there but on top of that there's physical comedy and the physical comedy is something that we discover as we you know go through the pipeline as we get into you know the design of the characters the movement of the characters mm -hmm. but I'm always looking for like the layer upon layer upon layer of of, of the joke and to be honest with you like comedy is where i am these days but when i first started as a story artist i was always getting action sequences because i was a oh. i was i was a half decent animator and i and i tend to animate my storyboards and um i draw fast so like like being able to like you know put up 500 drawings fairly quickly um is great for action sequences and i i think action and comedy kind of are similar in that like mm -hmm. when you're dealing with an action sequence what you're trying to do is you're playing with the audience and that sometimes you want the audience to be ahead of you like mm -hmm. if the train is coming down the track and about to roll over you know the the hero tied up on the yeah. rails like the audience needs to sort of be ahead of you and so all the action that is taking place is against this ticking clock of of where that fuse is about to hit the bomb mm -hmm. and the same it's the same execution for a lot of physical comedy um if you look at like the three stooges or like the old you know marx brothers like a lot yeah. of jokes come from like making sure the audience is with you and yes. like, actually going back to stand-up a lot of stand-up is about you know finding jokes that allow the audience to be with you but then surprising them so it's like the audience thinks they know where you're going and then you just you, you, you almost get there and you just sidestep a little bit, but you have to let mm -hmm. them know where, where you're going or else they're not going to be happy when you sidestep. And mm -hmm. so it's the same thing with um, like, I think action and comedy are very similar because it's all about the mechanic, which I love. And, that, and to be honest with you, so is drama too. It's just drama tends to be more focused on performance from. Exactly. Yeah. And so like when, when I'm doing a dr dramatic sequence, especially when I'm like directing, I tend to want the voice to lead and, and then let the camera uh, sort of respond to where the emotions are and sometimes the emotions are off camera sometimes they're on camera but I think um, mm -hmm. 
all those things. Like I just love, I love the chemistry and, and, you know, we were working on the Willoughby's and um, we were coming out in like four months. So we were almost at the end of the production. And one mm -hmm. of the things I love doing is bringing in other people, like to those cold eyes. And I brought in uh, Bob Fisher, who was uh, my, my editor on Cloudy 2, and I worked with him on Cloudy 1. And mm -hmm. he uh, he was the editor on Spider-Verse. So he's like just a, a brilliant, just smart filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And he sat in editorial with us for two days. And, you know, the result of that was we, we just, in, in about five or six sequences i just moved the camera and i and i covered a different character you know as opposed to where i was and in like adding like maybe 20 close-ups on tim i took mm -hmm. a character that was my lead that wasn't tracking as hard as i as as much as i wanted him to be mm -hmm. tracked audience and it made the audience care about him more by by putting the camera on him mm -hmm. when another character talking and it was just like that kind of like lesson is something that you just have to be open to. And no matter how much yeah. I think I know about the business until you actually put it up on the wall uh, and play it for an audience, you really, you, I think that calibration is necessary. So as I far see. as like movies go and how they travel, I think that's the process is you got to say it out loud a lot until you find the consistent laugh or the consistent emotion or the consistent reaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, did I get it right? Like because um, when when you mentioned that you um, played for audience, is that like the people in the studio mostly, or sometimes you uh, bring it to? I mean, bring other people's like you mentioned the your producer and other people to mm -hmm. watch the movie and get their opinions on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, every every filmmaker is is different. Um, the mm -hmm. way I like. The, my process is very much like you know oversharing. So like I will show, I will show you know sequences early, early, early to the crew, um, and and that that's my first audience. And like at the beginning of the movie, it's generally just a handful of pre-production people, and you know you mm -hmm. just hope they don't quit because it's not good. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. usually at that point, the movie is it's, it's bloated and it, it's you know there's there's like moments that just aren't working and it's often too long. But even in those awkward early cuts, there's always something that becomes mm -hmm. your movie. Um, and it's like looking for that weird thing that you just didn't know whether you should commit to it or not. So that first audience is the crew. And then after about six months, you burn through them and they've seen it too many times. And so they're, they, you know, it's almost like um, just like a, you know, used tissue, you know, once you've blown your nose into a pole. <laughs> <laughs> not that I throw away the crew but, they, but then I'm looking for like you know uh, then you start bringing in friends and family so you just yeah. invite people to the studio and then and then once mm. you kind of exhaust that group then you got to go out to I mean for us like we were in Vancouver so then I then I started to you know show it in LA to the Netflix people and mm -hmm. that was something that they didn't make us do but we we wanted it and it was mm -hmm. brutal because that was a completely cold audience and the cultural difference too between Canada and the States is enough that I, I started see. that I I learned a lot. And then once you kind of go through that a few times, then you start getting like real audiences in like theaters. So like, you know, we, we would just, you know, recruit an audience in Orange County or Riverside. And, and, and those are hard because, you know, you're going to get these notes that like, you know, I, I wish the movie was moving because <laughs> they're watching mm -hmm. drawings and a cold audience doesn't always understand what they're looking at. But you can still feel like where they're into it and where they're laughing and not. So yeah. the, the goal is to peak at the end because you're spending a lot of money. And so... You know, at the end of the day, if you can audition the material all the way through that process, by the end, mm -hmm. you have the version of the movie you hopefully like the best. But I, I also think it needs a certain skills to know uh, what kind of critics to get and what oh, yeah. kind of them to apply into your movie. Because at the end, you just you are the director and you have to go with your guts and see you. you I mean, you, you will definitely take the, the I mean, uh, author's opinion, but you have to finally go with your guts, I guess. And see yeah. what works best for the movie right because uh, hearing all these opinions as you said i i think it can be kind of overwhelming as well absolutely and and i'm yeah. that, that, that every every note is good but uh -huh. most solutions are bad <laughs> <laughs> Most solutions are bad. So yeah, yeah. Um, when I say every note is good, is that like even the ones you hate, like I, I would get notes that just would drive me up the wall. Um, mm. But what it would force me to do would be argue back. 
and figure out why I'm getting this note. And especially mm. if I get a note from like four or five different people. Like, for example, we had a screening on the Willoughby's that was uh, like in about a year before our release mm-hmm. date. And one of the things that surprised me was that the movie was playing mean. Like there was there was a sense that it was a very cynical film. And mm. I and and while there's like a big kind of subversive joke at the nut of the film, I didn't want it to feel mean. So that was a good lesson. And mm-hmm. so if I didn't have the, the the notes that, to be honest with you, I didn't love a lot of the, 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 the feedback mm-hmm. because it was coming after the comedy. But what I could do is step back from it and say, OK, I want it to be funny and I don't want to pull back on what I find subversive and unusual about this story from the book. But mm-hmm. I don't want it to be mean. I'm trying to make a movie about kindness, about love, about family. So I need to adjust how I'm telling this story. And so, you know, I think you have to hear that because otherwise you finish the product and you find out too late that you're not saying what you think you're saying. Mm-hmm. So um, I think yeah, okay. I, and I and I think. The other thing that, you know, watching good filmmakers like Miller and Lord, you know, like uh, working with uh, Peter Lord at, at Ardman or, or you know, um, Nick over there and, and like mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. such great Jill Colton's an amazing director. Uh, animation is slow. And if you screw something up and you make the movie worse, there's time to go backwards. And an idea that you've created and put into the world kind of mm. never goes away. So like even like three years into the process, like there was one sequence on, you know, on on the last film where, you know, we'd gone past the point of it working and it was getting overwritten. It was getting heavy. And all we needed to do is sort of look back at an old cut and go, oh, wait a second. We've, we've lost the, the freshness. Let's just mm-hmm. step back a second. Um, so, so the fact that, you know, every decision you're making is a choice in the moment. And as you get more context, those choices hone in, but the choices are never forever until the very, really the very end. I, I, it's a I bit also, like raising kids, you know, it's like if my if my daughter has a, you know, a bad week and she fails a math test, it doesn't mean I throw her out <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know, you'll never be good at math. Like that's, yeah. that's a thing to do as a father it's just like okay well we just gotta work on this you know yeah, or maybe it's the perception thing or maybe you need uh yeah maybe maybe you just need to sleep more like I, there's always something going on and so like i think that's part of the the the, the frustration with the job is that it's, it's never it's never one thing there's no formula for it but um mm-hmm. it's also what's exciting about it you know yeah, but I also think that it's, uh, it's like it also again needs a skill to know like what doesn't work for the movie and also not getting attached to an idea, you know, like you find a joke hilarious and then you try to fit it in in the movie no matter what, like like a piece of puzzle that doesn't fit in and you're just forcing it to stay in the movie. So what you um, meant, I mean, you said is actually really um, informative to know that, um, yeah, I mean, you kind of I need to get, get, get the credits and see what works for the movie, what doesn't work for the movie and uh, get the feedbacks and try to fix it in a way and try to actually um, see the points that audience are mentioning and um, try to see from their point of view. Like, because when, when we get involved with the movie, obviously after a while we couldn't understand like what's working and what's not working and we're too involved in it. But when you just step back and look at it again, you will definitely realize what, what's lack on the movie and what's working it and what's not, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta kill some babies, you know. And, and um, it's it's actually one of the things that uh, has been a big journey for me as far as you know, a growing up and b figuring mm-hmm. out what it means to do this this job, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of being a, a filmmaker or director or a storyteller or a writer. How much of the job is about listening? Which is mm-hmm. ironic because I'm on a podcast here and I'm just talking, <laughs> so I'm not listening a lot. Uh, I think I think that you know, coming back to what to keep and what to change and how to how to be mindful of of, or how to use notes how to use mm-hmm. audience feedback mm-hmm. i think first you have to listen and you have to you know if you're aiming for a laugh and you don't get it it's not the audience's fault mm-hmm. and you have to hear that and you mm-hmm. have to then stand back and go and i've seen it where you add three frames of a hold like three frames an audience won't even perceive it and and like 
in the, being in the theater and moving past the eyeball. But three frames can mean the difference from a chuckle to a laugh. Mm. And it's, if you don't listen, you, you won't find those three frames or you'll miss it. So a lot of the process is being quiet. And I think it's a, it's a yeah. hard, it's it's a hard thing to do because it, you know as a director, especially I think if you come from a live action mentality, you know you're supposed to know everything. You're supposed to be a general, and you're supposed to be you know alpha. Mm-hmm. On this. But animation is not that way. And it's a, again, I, I think animation is closer to theater and stand up than it is to live action. It's a very different animal. Yeah, um, I see. So um, I also want to ask another question about like um, when 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 you were uh, working in Wheel of Bees, you start as sort of like an in- indie film with And then you work with Baron Studio, am I right? Right, right. Uh, Braun, Braun. It's Braun. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> and and then you obviously had to like pitch it to Netflix. Yeah, you pitch it to Netflix, right? So um, I I I think it's also like pitching a story is another thing that a lot of people struggle with. Like maybe you are a funny person and you um, have the let's say you have the crafts and you are a good storyboard artist, but when it comes to like pitching your story or Uh, trying to sell your ideas to others you fail so <laughs> I would like okay. to know like because I, I, I obviously seen you on workshops and I know how funny you are so and uh, one of the things that I really love about your uh, you when you're performing or saying something even while we are talking you're really when you telling a story Uh, it's really engaging like you really want to listen and you always raise your voice make different voices you're so passionately talking about everything so um yeah so um which is amazing actually this is like i think you can definitely sell your ideas as well so um i want to know like how can you get this skill because a lot of artists are introvert persons so um probably they are great artists but they 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 never can sell their ideas or never they never can reach out Out there to I don't know I'm not, I'm not really talking about only like being in the story about artist any sort of artist but well, um, I mean um, because you're like I yeah. think um, <laughs> it was uh, Phil Lord uh, I think was the first person that said this to me which I don't think he came up with but you know it's show business mm-hmm. not show show friends so that word business is important and mm-hmm. we often like as commercial artists like struggle I think sometimes with that relationship to that idea of what it means to be in a business but Mm -hmm. I think if you boil it down in a way that doesn't make it feel like selling out the truth Mm -hmm. is what I'm doing with my life and the reason I'm able to feed my kids and keep a roof over my head is because I work in the entertainment business and so 90% of what I'm doing on a daily basis is trying to figure out how to talk to an audience and how to make something that you know people will want to watch so Mm -hmm. the truth is no matter how good you draw most people don't give a shit about drawings because it's not about Mm -hmm. the drawing it's about the idea that's in the drawing and so Mm -hmm. when you're pitching i think The, and I'm actually doing this a lot right now because I'm in the development cycle. So I'm, I'm pitching a lot and I'm trying to figure out to some extent what the poster is, you know? So like you come up with a, you spend like four weeks, you know, breaking story with a, with a team of, you know, in a writer's room and you come up with plot and you come up with character voice and you come up with, you know, we could do this and we could do that, blah, 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 blah. But when I go to the studio, like I got about five minutes to sell an idea because people mm-hmm. are busy and they, and they lose interest. And if I can't hook them in two minutes, I'll, I can't get them to buy it in five. So I really got to hook them in two minutes and to hook them in two minutes. I actually got to get them probably within 10 seconds of walking into that room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so ultimately what you're doing is marketing and When I try to sell an idea, what I what I what I think is you go in with the notion of this is why an audience will watch this movie. This is mm-hmm. why I fell in love with this idea. So, you know, I remember going into Netflix with the Willoughby's and like there's a lot of stuff in Lois Lowry's book. But for me, I love the notion about, you know, four kids who orphan themselves and then discover that being an orphan in the modern world kind of sucks. And so they go on a road trip to try to unorphan themselves. And along the way, they figure out the difference between the family they're born into and the family they choose. And I can say that mm-hmm. a thousand times because I've said it a thousand times because that's my poster. Yeah. And I can sit yeah. with one one image. And, you know, 
it gets more complicated when you get into the real marketing of a film because then you start focus grouping and then, you know, I can't say the word orphan because I might offend, you know, people in Nebraska and blah, blah, blah. But at the mm-hmm. beginning, I'm just going for that, that nut, you know, that thing at the center of it, you know? And I think, you know, a lot of it's luck, you know, you know, being in the uh, right place at the right time when the window opens and you can get through that hole. So I think the other, the other lesson is rejection is part of the business. And then everybody is always saying that, but, when you get rejection, I think the trick is to sort of, you know, recalibrate and constantly be asking yourself, you know, what is the story? Why do I love this? Why do I care? And if it was easy, everybody would do it. So it, it's part of the game, you know, being mm-hmm. being in that space. So I think ultimately, I think, you know, whether you're a visual artist or a writer or an actor or a comedian, you know, 90% of the job is trying to get honest about what you're trying to, to create and honest mm-hmm. in the way that, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a, a painter, I don't need to sell to a mass audience. I just need to have an identity and I need to sort of come up with my own voice. It's, that's a lot different than what I'm doing where I'm closer to being a stand up where I want to be able to walk into a room of 200 people and get them all to like me and get them mm-hmm. all to care about what I'm saying. So it's just a different business. So yeah. when I'm pitch, when I'm pitching, I'm thinking of that poster is like, how can we get 10 million people around the world to want to watch this. Yeah, um, exactly. Because that's the yeah, game. I see. Also, you yeah. uh, you have a great um, TED talk about failure, which I'll definitely put the link for the audience to go and watch them because, um, uh, yeah, you you always like say great things and it's always so inspiring to listen to you. Um, I have another question that we're talking about like Wheel of Bees. This, Wheel is, is based on a book, so you add up the story from the book. So I would mm-hmm. like to know like how, how how different it is from like um uh, what was actually cloudy one your original idea was it your idea or no 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 Cl- cloudy one was a book too oh mm-hmm. okay all right so uh anyway so uh, how how does it like uh, work to adopt a book and kind of try to you, you know uh, from what i know from willoughby's you try to make it more like modern and uh, suitable for the modern audience and all that so um mm-hmm. how how much can you just um stick to the original idea and how much you can play around with the story and make it more let's say fun for the audience to watch right i mean i learned a lot on cloudy one watching chris and phil you know uncover that story i mean um one of the things that that was was there early in 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 the process of making cloudy at least Mm -hmm. from my memory was you know the guys came up with this like the the book this it was a like a 30 page picture book and it was about this happening where food fell from the sky and Mm -hmm. you know you're you're looking at like kind of the mid 2000s and and you know uh i think the joke was what if we did a disaster movie for kids where instead of it being like a roland emmerich style 2012 you know people running away from the cold or tornadoes or you know uh armageddon there's a meteor coming what if it instead of it being a meteor it was a meteor uh shower like as in meatballs falling from the sky that's a really terrible pun so that kind of joke doesn't travel when you when you cross languages um but like that that notion of what the story is like so they took this this kids book and said well what if we made a disaster movie for kids and so as the story evolves and changes you have this sort of Im- immediate emotional reaction to the material and now when when i read the willoughby's i mean my emotional reaction was that it was a it was a story that was written to make fun of children's literature in a way that love children's literature so mm-hmm. like it, it wasn't trying to be um, derogatory towards it. Uh, Lois Lowry reminded me of, you know, reading Roald Dahl when I was a kid, like how mm-hmm. in, in Roald Dahl stories, like adults weren't, they didn't have to be nice to children and children had to sometimes do bad things to get out of the story. Mm-hmm. And I really, I really love that sort of, it, and having my daughters, like uh, they're 17 and 20 now, but I went through the cycle of rereading all of that stuff to them when they were when they were kids, you know? And it's mm-hmm. like, when you're a kid, you read it and you experience the story. And then when you reread it as an adult to your own children, um, there's this sort of like funny layer of, of, of like, um, you know, that wink, wink, nod, nod, that Roald Dahl is writing stories for children, but he knows adults are going to read it too. And we all, we all have our relationship to what it, feels like to grow up and so Lois Lowry's book had that at at its core and I Mm. love the idea of like this really you know kind of successful version of what a nuclear family is 
But in that nuclear family, none of them could stand each other. And they were all looking for, they were looking to kind of like blow up their their family to make a better family. And mm-hmm. I think as we stand in a world where, you know, we're always in these culture wars, I think there was something really fun and potentially compelling about telling a story about a culture war within that one family. And this notion of, um, at the time, I mean, the politics of the world were becoming, you know, very uh, insular, like people were building walls to keep ideas out. And there was like, you know, the us and theming of society was starting to get louder. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell a story that went against that. And that was in the book. And so having those thematic ideas, that was that's the grounding. And so as I'm adapting the book, I mean, my first draft was actually very close to all of the plot structure of Lois Lowry's story. Mm-hmm. And as as you draft that out, like writing is rewriting, you know, stand back from it, share it with like people who I trust and and then start to get feedback. And then you start to realize that, you know, there's an idea that w- that works in the book because when you're reading, you're going at a pace where you can digest, you know, a lot of stuff. But as a, as a film goes by your eyeballs, you have to be concise. And if you don't have your message up front, you're going to, it's going to get lost. And so I start to make choices and move things around based upon the reaction I get from the material. And so, uh, yeah, that, that to me is the process of adapting the story and is always coming back to why did I fall in love with this at the beginning? And I say in love, I mean, like that, that mm-hmm. sounds hippy dippy, but I think it's like, like, what's the thing that, that you relate to? Yeah. What's, what's the, you know, what is, what's the thing that made you feel like this is you when you first read a book? Cause there's a lot of stories I read that I like and I, and I even can say I love, but I would never want to make movies about them because mm-hmm, I don't feel mm-hmm. like I have that, that, that core, but yeah. you know, I, as a 40, 40, I was 42 at the time when I started adapting the book, my kids were getting older. I was going through the kind of anxiety of like not being the same valued person as a father, because it's like, they don't need uh-huh. you. Uh, and that's healthy you know it's healthy that families step apart from each other because it's that's how we all grow up and it stops inbreeding and it creates better society and i was looking at my my daughters and um ironically i think like in this sort of world that we're living in like they wanted to protest when you know bad things are happening in the world and i grew up in the 80s never thinking that much about you know life or death situations and so i looked I at my politically yeah activated children and it made me want to tell a story about you know this yeah. notion that 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 if you try to not change change will find you whether yeah. you like it or not and i and i think even without judging it like one way or the other i think the comedy of the movie is this collision of like what it means to be an old fashioned family in a modern world and yeah. and 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 that just sort of felt and the second we made the cat the narrator where the whole story could be a fairy tale. It, mm-hmm. it just clicked. It just clicked for for my sensibilities because it it immediately became observational and it was mm-hmm. a stand back. And 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 again, maybe that's going back to stand up and sketch comedy and improv. Is we live in the world and we're always reacting. And so you have two choices sometimes in life. You can either get depressed or make a joke. And so I think uh, the Willoughby's was my version of making a joke. Yeah, and uh, the Willoughby's is actually uh, on Netflix, and people can go and watch it. And uh, what you mentioned, I-, I love the movie. To be honest, I remember that you actually uh, sent me a part of it. I'm I was so honored. I was like, ah, oh, I've seen <laughs> part of Willoughby's. <laughs> Yeah, but I, and I, even at that time, I remember I fell in love with the look of the movie. Like um, now that everyone heard about your journey of how you uh, was a two D animator and the, the storyboard and everything, um, the Willoughby's I think have all of that things that you were talking about. Like it's kind of look hip read stop motion three D two D thing, but it's all CGI of course. But um, yeah, and I really love the story and how I, actually it was it, it looks really dark in the beginning, but um, it, it was one of those animations that I watched and I, I couldn't guess the ending like i don't uh-huh. want to spoil but but yeah 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 but at the end of a movie when they were actually rescuing the parents i was expecting like all oh, right it's going to be like the fairy tale thing, as you were saying but it was like uh-uh. okay so yeah very interesting so i actually think uh, we are running out of time so if you um i mean i also need to 
emphasis on this because um, a lot of people sometimes ask me like how can we become a director of animation and I always answer like it's a long way especially if you want to direct a feature it's a lot of things that you have to learn and it's a long journey obviously like with indie animation that works differently because you can just solo animate something and then go to the festivals and become successful you know but yeah, yeah. now now that everyone heard um, Chris's story they hopefully will get the answer of how to become an amazing director um so is there I, anything I, that you, you, I think I think I think the trick is 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 honestly I am so jealous of anybody living now because they've got cameras in their pockets that they can shoot movies and you can you can be anything you want to be in front of that camera and if you want to be a director, the trick is direct, you know, tell yeah. stories like all a director is. I mean, outside of like the, you know, the 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 Hollywood, you know, kind of impression of what it means to be a director. All you're doing is telling stories. Yeah. And so, you know, we live in a world where, you know, A, you can just make stuff with that computer in your pocket. And B, mm -hmm. you can just put it up online and get feedback. And it's yeah. amazing. And uh, I just finished, you know, the Duplass brothers. Have, have you ever... Uh, Heard of them? They did the uh, uh, Comfy Chair and and Cyrus and Togetherness as a HBO series, but they're no. two brothers, uh -huh. and they um they uh, they're kind of in, independent film darlings, and they you know they've got this amazing career, but uh, uh, ninety percent of what they they talk about in terms of why they are successful and what what it means to be a you know a filmmaker to them is is they just make movies, and they mm -hmm. they sometimes when you you know, you look at the impossibility of getting, you know, a hundred million dollar budget and 500, you know, crew members underneath you. It's, it's, it sounds impossible. Well, you don't start there. You start with $20, a computer in your pocket and an idea, and you just go and you make it. And if you do that enough, you start to get the skills you need to then, you know, make bigger and bigger and bigger stories. And I think, um, I think that's, uh, that's the way you become a director is get those skills. Mm -hmm. And you just got to learn by doing, you know? Yeah, exactly. I actually, <laughs> talking about budget, that's a good point because a lot of people just want to get that 100 million budget and run away, you know, without making a movie. Remember what we say, it's show business and, you know, $100 million. If someone gives you $100 million without cement shoes, you know, you're, uh, you gotta, you gotta make something. You better do, yeah. Is, is there anything that you would like to um, add, like, uh, I don't know, just to the audience and to the uh, maybe the students out there or other professionals that are listening right now. I have a question for you. Like, like my, yeah. point of, my point of view is, is, you know, very much like, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian, but like, you know, we, we live an hour away from the U S border and I spent most of my career down in, uh -huh. you know, Hollywood and stuff. Like, how does it feel being, you know, someone who's passionate about animation and the, and the cartoon business living in a different part of the world? Like, are, do you feel like there's access? out there like that you you have that, that ability to be this kind of artist um well wow okay <laughs> that's a philosophical question no 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 well you know you know i remember like uh, when i was young and i was just discovering animation and everything and obviously um i think that youtube was still new and um there was no facebook and there was mostly like blog spots and stuff i remember i was just emailing people from Blogspots, um, I mean, finding their names um, in the credits of animations and um, emailing them. I said, how can I become into the animation industry? They said, go to CalArts. I was like, that's not even an answer. <laughs> because right, at, right. at that time, you know, I, it, it wasn't like that for me to um, just go to such universities and suddenly, I mean, it, it was there was no way that 16 years old me, my parents just let me to flew alone to America or even come with me. But, but uh, I I, uh, usually I normally say that um, I mean my journey really changed throughout the way like I, I really you know that how I work to go to UK and then come back and all that and I, I always have that Disney dream and thought that I want to become like one of those people who work in Disney but my mindset when I uh, grew up and uh, learn more about animation and start to see more artists and talk with more people um, change you know and um, I mean did, did you ask actually about me because I just made it personal so whatever no 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 I, I did I did because it's it's it's, it's, inter it's interesting like we met 
um, when uh, I was in um, a school in Dubai. It yeah, was Dubai a, with, uh, yeah, yeah. with with Bobby, Bobby too. Yeah, yeah. And it's like I, I remember just thinking it's like you know the amount of people that you meet as you you know yeah, kind of yeah. go through this industry. Uh, even when I first went to the states, what I what I really what really blew my mind was like there was artists from all over the world. My first job, I was working with artists from the Philippines and Ireland yeah. and you know Australia, yeah. and I hadn't been to any of those places. I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, and it's like like just even the access to just talent with different points of view was was mind blowing. And yeah. uh, I, I just think the fact that, you know, um, in some ways the world is smaller, but it's also, I love that there's just different stories coming from different places. And I just, I hope that's the reality because I, I, I you know, I can sit, I can sit in London, Ontario here on my farm and, and say like anybody can 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 do this. But I don't know how yeah, true that yeah, is. Yeah. I, just, I hope I hope it is true. But I, uh, I don't, you, you know, know you, you know, there are a lot of like talented artists here and um, probably maybe let's say the access to the the um, information or some of people knowledge are not that vast but still um I, I i always say that if you want to get to somewhere you definitely one way or another sooner or later you will get there because uh we have a lot of like talented iranian artists that right now are working in different places like working in art man disney you know mm -hmm. in different ga game industry so uh, they also one day was a iranian kid who i don't know grew up with Terminator probably or I don't know mm -hmm. usually that that's yeah. a movie that everyone's fell in love and think that I want to be in movies <laughs> in the <industry laughs> and stuff you know um, but yeah and uh, because uh, you just mentioned that like Dubai it's just because uh, most of these uh, workshops happening around uh, I'm mean, not really happening in Iran so Dubai is the closest so um, um, in terms of getting access to it when you get the chance so that's why a lot of people come and travel for it to uh, visit other artists and see what's going on in the other side of the world in reality you know <laughs> yeah because because uh, seeing and hearing things on the internet and uh, i don't know talking with people is one thing but again uh, being in the place and talking person is another thing so yeah well yeah thank you for doing what you what you do because it's it's really cool that you're 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 doing this so yeah thank you oh, all the success yeah Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, actually, the point uh, of me doing this was to um, give this um, access to this information more to um, Iranian audience as well as other people, of course. But definitely, if you know English, that's cool. But um, I always um, do the translation and all the subtitles and everything, which actually takes time, to be honest. I can't great. believe it. I want to do this again in Farsi? We can. I can. I can. <laughs> that takes another ten years, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much, Chris. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and I truly enjoyed it. And I hope the audience also um, enjoyed it as well. Um, I really don't want to take much of your time, so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for doing this. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I really do hope that you enjoyed this episode. I think it was pretty. Pretty much obvious that I was so thrilled and excited to talk with Chris. He's a really dear person to me and it's always a pleasure to talk with him. As I have mentioned, Chris Pern also have a storyboard course in schoolism.com. I'll definitely put all the links in the description so you can go and check it out. In my Instagram under the name of Arezu Art, I have also introduced Chris Pern's children's illustrated book, which you can go and check it out as well. The best way you can support me is by liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and you know, whatever you can do to just share this podcast with your friends and spread the word, spread the love and more happiness and joy into this world. Until next time, I see you very soon.